Yeah, good. that sounds good. Oh my God, what a good crowd. Oh, I hope people stay. <laughs> <laughs> Rick's well, hard to fall That's on. right, that's right. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for being here at the PLC 2015. It's great to see so many familiar faces and folks that have been part of this effort. And thanks to Fred Anton and all yeah, the Fred. folks that put this on every single year. It's a wonderful event. Uh, and I know that it is an envy of many other states across the country uh, what we're able to pull together. And honestly, uh, I think, as we know, this helped revive a lot of the activities that are restoring Pennsylvania and restoring our country, giving us people like Pat Toomey uh, and someone as well who we're going to talk with right now, Speaker Mike Terzai. Uh, for those that don't know, I'm Matt Briette. I'm president of the Commonwealth Foundation, and uh, we are a free market think tank, and I encourage you to visit our booth out there. Uh, but Representative Terzai uh, is in his eighth term, uh, was elected Speaker of the House in the line of uh, Benjamin Franklin well, this last January by the full House, uh, presides over a Republican caucus at its largest, which, uh, what, in 50 years, neither party has experienced such a large margin of, of yes. votes there? Yes, it goes back to the 1950s. Yes, and so uh, Mike uh, is, in, is from Allegheny County, uh, and, and I call him Mike because, boy, I knew you when you were yes, just you uh, sort of rank and file. That's right. And has moved up uh, in leadership here. Uh, and it's been great because Mike has been a real champion for uh, lower taxes because we know that that's what creates greater prosperity is letting people decide how to spend their money. Legal reform has always been a key issue and certainly you help champion an expansion in, uh, of the Education Improvement Tax Credit, credit a nationally recognized school choice program here in Pennsylvania. But Mike, we have very limited time but I, and I wanna get to a lot of things. So uh, Governor Wolf in his budget address back in uh, March, he said that uh, his proposal is to deliver jobs that pay schools that teach, and government that works. Now, I don't know of anybody that, here that would disagree with those goals, uh, but as he laid it out, he basically said, you know how we're gonna get there is we're going to tax, we're gonna borrow, and we're gonna spend our way to prosperity. Uh, and as I've always said, if Pennsylvania is the next state to tax, borrow, and spend itself to prosperity, it will also be the very first right. uh, state. Um, I know that you don't disagree with those goals, but you have a very different way of getting there. And let, let's tackle each of these as, as you lead uh, the House of Representatives as the speaker. How are we going to get jobs that pay here in Pennsylvania? You know, Matt, um, over the last four years, the unemployment rate significantly was reduced from 8.2% uh, to approximately 4.7%. And the focus that we had had and that we're, we should continue to have is really how do you grow the private sector? It's not government. It's certainly by not increasing taxes by five billion this year and nine billion over the next two years. It's not by borrowing another five billion dollars that future taxpayers have to pay off. Um, it's not by uh, increased regulation. The key, I think, is uh, what, what we've been talking about for some time with the Chamber of Business and Industry and NFIB and others. Um, we want the private sector to flourish. And that means, I think, um, tort reform, unemployment compensation, and workers' compensation reforms. Get out of the way of the employers, the entrepreneurs that are making a difference. <laughs> Family sustaining jobs in the private sector will allow you to have good communities and good schools. And um, where we have also been focused, we, we want to make sure that the taxes that aren't are, all, are presently on employers. Um, we actually wanted to make significant changes to that and, and did, and we want to continue in that front. The governor wants to take it backwards. This capital stock and franchise tax, um, we made sure that it's going to phase out on January 1st of 2016, finally. And uh, secondly, the caps on net operating losses, he wants to, to, to really eliminate those, so it's going to hurt technical companies and manufacturing companies. Um, the, the, the approach that we have that stands significantly in contrast to the governor about family sustaining jobs is, is that taxing and borrowing and increased regulation will, will make Pennsylvania less of an employer uh, and will make the private sector less flourishing. And I think the most significant contrast is in, is in the energy area. 
We didn't impact V. Natural gas, the development of natural gas, is impacting real people on a day-to-day -day basis, upstream, downstream, and the producers. We went out and did a press event in Steelton, Pennsylvania. Two young guys bought a, a, a decaying steel, from, a steel uh, warehousing and plant from Bethlehem Steel. They are employing 150 new people to build pipeline and adding a second shift. Those are really great wages for real families so that we can develop steel. And well, that is for the natural gas industry. Well, and what's always amazing to me in this discussion is though uh, these taxes that they want, that Governor Wolf and many others want to apply to the industry, uh, don't understand that businesses really don't pay taxes at all. Only people pay taxes, and that would be you and I and the middle class families that he says he wants to help uh, would be paying in higher energy costs because those taxes always get passed on to the consumer. Matt, I, I'm all over the state, and I can't tell you how many people I run into. Um, I ran into a mom uh, recently back in my district who said, Mr. Torsai, please tell the governor he's got this wrong. Um, my daughter has come back to the Pittsburgh area. She's an environmental engineer. She works for a company that actually makes sure that all the water is clean from the uh, development of natural gas. She'll tell you, first of all, that it is clean. And second of all, we can't tell you how excited we are to have her back. You talk to people with architects, you talk to people who are in contracting, trucking, truck sales, auto sales, commercial real estate. A, a gentleman with the, a, 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 a catering business, uh, Hog Farmers, I think is what he called it, is, has like three ships of people out there making sure that, uh, that uh, they have, you know, that the, they're, they're being fed on the, she, uh, the, the various shifts and he's making significant money. Entrepreneurs, and that's downstream and upstream, and guess what, all that capital is coming into Pennsylvania. And those people are driving the economy, regular folks. One person told me in Westmoreland County, they went from 10 people in their engineering firm to 50. Everybody's buying a new car. They've been buying a new truck every year. And that's the kind of thing that a flourishing economy is driven by. And so it's kind of, is driven let, by. This, let this blossom. Let it happen. Let it happen and don't get government in the way. And you get this. energy independence, get away from OPEC, energy independence. You get manufacturing and petrochemical jobs here in Pennsylvania, grow those jobs, family sustaining jobs. That's the, the type of energy policy and jobs policy we need in Pennsylvania. Not more taxes, not more uh, borrowing, not more regulation. Let the economy flourish. Kind of the uh, Hippocratic oath, first do no harm, correct? Right. Uh, let's, let's take that. Let's go to the second one, Mike, uh, schools that teach. Uh, we know that Pennsylvania is uh, in the top 10 per spending uh, per student, uh, in spending per student in the country. Uh, that many of our urban areas that uh, where performance is really low are some of the highest spending. I mean, we're next to Harrisburg here. We're spending over 18,000 per, per student, student oh. yet have graduation rates that are far below acceptable, 45% uh, at best. Um, how do we get, I mean, Governor Wolf, of course, uh, wants to just throw more money at this. He says we have, we cut spending, right? Uh, we, we, we had a billion dollar cut, right? Everybody believes that billion dollar. But what, what do you think we need to do in education to get schools that teach? And ultimately, it's more, how do we get students to be able to learn? Because that's our ultimate goal, correct? Matt, it, it, it's, it's, it's such a great question. And, and um, the governor's just off base on this. He, he, he's bought into these myths that are just, just completely untrue. And, and folks, we, we have to begin to, to, to take on the uh, propositions that people just buy into. Look. Going back as far as 1949, we had made a decision in this state and uh, that, that taxpayers would pay for education, public education, on both a state and local level. School districts, just like municipalities, are instruments of the state. To a certain extent, people wanted it to be school districts, I think, so that if you were paying taxes, at least the money's going back into your community and, and you, you can see the impact back, back, back home. But combined, and, and to, to separate them is, is it's just not appropriate, in my, my opinion. It's disingenuous. We spend, in Pennsylvania today, $27 billion on public education, K through 12. It's on average, uh, well, uh, I think it's $14,600 per student in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, with a declining enrollment. And, and we are, 
in some, um, the last uh, statistic I saw, we were actually ranked 13th in per pupil spending, sixth in overall spending, fifth highest out of 50 states in money spent on teachers and administrators. And you can argue about what the tax is, you can argue about whether we should collect it on a local or state level, but you cannot argue that we are not spending enough. We're spending more than enough. So we need to, you're, you're saying we need to spend smarter. How, yes. how would we, how yes. should we be doing this? And, and you know, Matt, it, it's interesting. I, I know you've been a, a really, you've, you've been probably one of the most significant champions of school choice in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, one of the leaders. We, we did double the educational improvement tax credit, also adding the opportunity scholarship tax credit. We loosened up the, significantly loosened up the restrictions on, on homeschooling. Um, we, we have really been at, at, at the forefront and we, we really basically coerced Philadelphia into allowing more charter schools. But choice is a significant, a significant uh, education item, I think, that allows students to thrive. Um, I, w I was blessed to be able to go down to Mastery uh, Charter School in, in, in Philadelphia and met Masson and met Derek, two young men, uniforms, very disciplined, just unbelievably respectful. Both of them accepted in a multitude of, of, of colleges. And uh, what they told us, a group of us were there to see them, is, is that when they had come to school, there was no expectation that they could go to higher education or, or, or to have a career. But in that charter school, from a very early age, they had the mindset that if they focused on math and English and stayed out of trouble and were respectful of teachers and family, that they could succeed. And, and here they are succeeding in a, in a fairly economically disadvantaged neighborhood. I think that Catholic schools and Christian schools and, and, and charters and homeschooling are options. Now, does that mean that we are not supportive of, of uh, traditional public schools? No, it's not true. I, I've got kids at North Allegheny back home that are just an outstanding public school, but I've got a kid who's in Catholic high school too who made that choice. Now, we can afford it, my wife and I. Lydia, Lydia's a pediatrician, I, I work here as speaker. And, uh, but, but many families don't have those options. And I think when parents and grandparents 44,000 on the waiting list for charter yeah, schools in yeah. Philadelphia. Already 60,000 out of 200,000 kids are in charter schools. That has to be at the top of our education agenda. That's how we'll know that each kid is actually getting what he or she wants. It, it can't be directed by Harrisburg. The market will decide what's the best outcome. Well, and unfortunately, what we've seen in the budget, yes, absolutely. Uh, unfortunately, Governor Wolf has, uh, wants to take away some of those choices does, and reduce them. Uh, hopefully you, you guys will uh, stay strong and protect the demands that parents are making for those educational opportunities. We got about two minutes left. Yes, sir, but, go right ahead. Um, so government that works. Now, <laughs> it's hard. <laughs> is that kind of like military intelligence? I mean, since, uh, sorry, Jay. <laughs> you know, it's interesting that um, it is a democracy, and, and, and I, Matt is a big, I, I know, Winston Churchill fan, and I never quite get the, the, uh, the quote correct, but, you know, he says, uh, you know, out of all the, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but of all the types of government, democracy still works best, even though it's a, a, a difficult government to, to, to move forward through. But, but it is a marketplace of ideas. And uh, the key thing about government working best is this. You, you can't let special interests uh, take over. And um, that, that includes the big unions or big corporations. Um, you have to have a mindset that actually is focused on how do we, get out of the way in many instances and let government, um, let the private sector uh, thrive. And, and that doesn't mean there's not a role for the private sector or for the government sector or the public sector, because there is. But we shouldn't be doing things that we don't do. So let's get down to the core government functions. I, I know liquor privatization is something I've, I've touted. Oh, you're, you're for that? I am. Okay. <laughs> we, we, we passed. We, we passed it again in the House, uh, you know, with 100 and 114 votes just uh, about two months ago. And why? It's not merely that we want convenience like wine and grocery stores. That's important. But it's to show that there are many areas of government that we should not be in. And if you let the private sector do it, guess what? You're not going to have pension problems. You're, you're not going to have wage issues. You're, you're not going to have inefficiencies. Let, we'll, we're going to tax it, we'll regulate it, we'll, we'll do licensing and law enforcement. 
That's what we but do. We're all going to become alcoholics right. Right, if we do this. I mean, that's what's happened in the other 48 states that did this, right? But you do that, or like the gas works in Philadelphia. Well, why does Philadelphia own a, own a gas utility? Like, let the private sector do it. And, and, and uh, government should do what it does best, and it should be limited to core government functions. And, and I'm hoping that we can stand strong, because I think, unfortunately, our, our new governor believes in an expansionist approach to government. They know better than we do how to spend our money. They know better than we do how to borrow money. They know better about how to police things. It's, it's, it's a little bit, um, it's elitist. Yeah. You know, well, there's and, an and elitism Mike, to it. On, the, on that, this is where, you know, Governor Wolf's biggest campaign contributors were the government employee unions. And the single largest one was SEIU that gave him almost a million dollars in campaign contributions. His very first action in office was a, a gift ban. Executive order number one was a gift ban saying anybody that has business before the state uh, cannot take so much as a cup of coffee or a bottle of water. Like, I couldn't give you a bottle of water on the stage if you were in the administration. Yet he took millions of dollars from these organizations that are now going to get billions of dollars in taxpayer money, while at the same time he's issuing other executive orders to allow for the unionization of direct home caregivers. Yeah, it, I mean, this is, this is really going against what he has even argued, or at least said he stands for. This isn't government that works. This seems like more of like a, a cronyism that's going on. You, you know, Matt, um, I, first of all, Matt Gobbler has that bill that you and I were talking about, my colleague from uh, Clearfield and Elk Counties, that says before anybody signs on to these uh, contracts between government and the public sector, you've got to have a sunshine period because it's the details mm -hmm. where it's frightening. But also the notion that the governor should be intervening to get um, private sector employees at UPMC to be unionized by the SEIU, to like use your heavy hand to yeah. do that. I, I think Senator Scarnati was right to call that out and say that's not right. And I also think that the notion of, 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 of making sure that home health care workers, many done by uh, private sector non nonprofits or for profits, to, to make them be able to be unionized by an ex executive order is just wrong. We, we are arguing that in court. And um, this expansionist approach to government is going to set us back. And that's not where most of uh, America on the state level is heading. Well, we, we've think, seen yeah. enough of Obama. Uh, <laughs> we have. On we a have. national level. And certainly, uh, apparently, this governor thinks that he has a mandate to govern, yet uh, we've seen the largest majorities of Republicans. Uh, should we expect to be paying higher uh, income taxes or sales taxes by the end of this budget? Give it, tell us where this is going to head. I, I, I can tell you that uh, the Republican leadership in both the House and the Senate, are, we are going to hold the line on taxes. And the other key thing, <laughs> no, no disrespect to anybody over the last four years. The House Republicans uh, have been doing it for the last four years even, uh, and, and, and even the last four years of Rendell as well. Um, the, the, the key thing is, is we're focused on public pension reform, moving at least new hires to defined contribution plans, privatizing liquor, and, uh, and making sure that the shale industry continues to, to, to be abundant in, in energy independence in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Well, Speaker Mike Terzai, thank you for spending time with us here today and uh, fight for the taxpayers there in Harrisburg. Thank you so much, Matt. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.